Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. We ought to feel the joy of the Lord this morning. We ought to be the happiest people in the world. In fact, we are. When I was a kid growing up, they used to sing a song, We're a happy people. Yes, we are. Been baptized in Jesus' name. Spoke in tongue when the Holy Ghost came. Amen. And uh, thank God. We got some young men up here that are going to give us a few songs before the Bible class. I'm glad you got here early, got here on time. Amen. We are blessed. Can you say amen? amen. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you that you're in our midst right now. You said where two or three are gathered together, you'd be there. And we know the devil's a liar. We thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do this morning. We have no comprehension, Lord, of how great and fabulous and magnificent you are. Let us get a glimpse of you today, Lord, in this service. Let us think your thoughts and breathe your breath. Let us be like Jesus. Quit being who we are and start being who you want us to be. <laughs> Woo! Glory, glory, glory. Let's stand to our feet and goodbye and give the Lord some praise right there.
Amen. We're not on our own this morning. We got an undergirding power. One preacher said, the power behind me is greater than the task before me. Turn around and shake hands with your neighbor and say, everything's going to be all right. Everything, not just part of everything, everything. Everything is going to be all right. Hallelujah. Sing it. to come and receive the Sunday morning Sunday school children's offering from downstairs. We have Sunday school going on down there. Money has been spent for those beautiful, precious children. Although the bus didn't run this morning and the van was broke down and we, for the first time in 42 years since I've been here, uh, things like that do happen sometimes. So help me pray that we can get the starter fixed on the van and the 
a heater hose leaking water on the bus. Yeah, if you pray, God will answer prayer. And if anybody here could fix those things, you know, money will fix anything. But we try to save our money if we possibly can. Yeah, take it to the mechanic. It costs five hundred dollars, probably, to put that starter in. A little snap, crackle, and pop is all it takes. But that's all right. They got to make a living too, you know. But the Lord can help us to get a good deal somewhere. Get it fixed for just maybe a hundred bucks. It's cold out there, though. Getting underneath that. Let's don't go there. Brother Marion, would you pray over this offering? Amen. Bring a little something for the children downstairs, if you would, please. God bless you. yesterday and last evening we took the youth to Kansas City to go ice skating and oh man did we ever have a good time 
Amen. Just everybody feeling good. Yes. We got the singing there in that little walkway between the Crown Center Mall and the Union Station. <laughs> you could feel the Lord That's in right. that house. They started out singing Silent Night, and then they started singing Amazing Grace, and I had to get them on, on video, put it on Facebook, and everybody's making comments, and people was clapping their hands, center people were clapping their hands, listening to us sing, them sing, I wasn't singing, that's why I was so good, hallelujah, hallelujah, and we get to come to church this morning and feel the Lord some more, oh I know it may be cold outside, but it's warm in here, amen. Amen. Well, we want to get into the word of the Lord. Sorry we don't have a powerful evangelist here this morning like we did last week. Wasn't that good? Oh, man. I love it when a preacher gets in his pulpit with the anointing of God. And uh, But we're here today, and we want to discuss the word of God. Not just the Word of God, but a particular part of the Word of God. And that is the divine nature, the nature of God. Peter mentioned that divine nature in 2 Peter 1 and 4, where he said we have access to a nature that's a little better than we are. Amen. Have you ever noticed how bad your nature is? Yes. Yes. I, I catch myself. I try to catch myself before I say it. I think it, have you ever noticed you can't hardly say it without thinking it first? <clears throat> Let's don't talk about me. Let's talk about the divine nature. Amen. And, uh, I've noticed that, have you ever noticed people that were just naturally good-natured people? They could forgive when they got done wrong. And uh, that kind of felt bad whenever people that did them wrong had bad things happen to them. And uh, they grieved over the suffering of their enemies. Anybody got an enemy? I guess we all have people around us that get on our nerves. They don't mean to be our enemies, but they seem to be people that don't like us. Can you love your enemies? Can you forgive your enemies? Those people that do you wrong? Paul said... For when we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now think about that. Christ died for his enemies. Christ died for bad people. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yea, peradventure, for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I like that. You know, when you die for someone, that's pretty commendable. Give up your life. It's part of that divine nature that God has that we don't know much about. And I've noticed that there are people, like I said a while ago, that evidently they came from a good family. I came from a mediocre family. We weren't perfect. We weren't really, really bad. We weren't really, really good. We were somewhere... We were somewhere on the dark board, so to speak. And yet, 
As a kid growing up, I noticed that there were some of my friends that when you got in their home, that their mother spoke with such kindness. And their dad seemed to speak with kindness that I was kind of not used to. I liked it. I did. I thought, that's really neat to talk to one another like that. I guess where I came from, we didn't talk to one another real nice. And I, uh, I play handball with a man at the Y that he's so selfless that uh, he's donated money to the Y. He's a man of means, and yet when they put his name on the floor, when they redid the floors on the courts, the, the uh, handball courts, they have uh, four of them, and they, they put his name on the floor of the handball court and he demanded that they take his name off of that because he didn't want his name on there because he's such a humble guy how many of us would do that <laughs> and I've uh, noticed that he's very selfless and very kind never speaks with strife in his voice. I've never heard him raise his voice. And I uh, thought, it'd be neat to be raised by perfect parents. I wasn't raised by perfect parents. But I've been adopted, hallelujah, Amen. into a beautiful family where people esteem others better than themselves. I've been adopted into a family where <clears throat> people don't look on their own things, but they look on the things of others. I've been adopted into a family where we prefer one another and we don't step on one another and we don't hurt one another and if we find out we did, we apologize. And we keep things right with everybody around us. If you didn't grow up in a family like that, I got news for you. You can be adopted too. You can have righteousness put on your record just by believing and receiving. And when I think about the family of God in the Bible, when I read about the genealogy of Jesus, you know, it's in two places, one in Matthew 1 and Luke, the third chapter. It's the genealogy. It's his history. It's his ancestry. It's his family tree. <clears throat> it appears that God was looking for a good family, doesn't it? Of all the families of the earth, it appears that God looked down and he saw a man by the name of Abraham. And I don't know what it was about Abraham, but he was just a naturally good guy. You know how I know that? Because he had a nephew by the name of Lot who had a lot of flocks and a lot of herds and and uh, they got into it with one another and there was quarreling between the herdsmen of Abraham and the herdsmen of Lot's and, and, uh, and, and Abraham had this amazing attitude. He went to Lot and he said, you know, if, if these guys keep on fussing, you and me liable to start fussing and we don't want to do that. Amen. And so he said, Lot, maybe it's time for us to kind of part company. And he said, if you... If you go to the left, then I'll go to the right. But if you choose that part over there to the right, I'll go this way over here. You decide which you want. Boy, what a spirit. I'm willing to take second best. I'm willing for you to have something better than I've got. What an ad I mean, you know, God must have been up there looking down thinking, hey, that guy's got a pretty good nature about him. You know, selfishness really gets you in big trouble. Did you know that? 
No, you didn't know that. But I just want to tell you this morning that, that you know, you, you want to be above people. You wanting to be better than people. You wanting your way. You wanting to look good. You wanting to think people, make people think you're smart or you're handsome or you're pretty or whatever. That can really get you in big trouble and I can show you plenty of people in the Bible that got in big trouble because they wanted to look good. You know, you don't look good. You're ugly. You're pitiful. But I've told my beautiful, precious little daughters, and it got on their nerves, and they, they, they hold it against me to this day. I've told them growing up, I said, pretty is as pretty does. If you do pretty, then you're pretty. But the scripture says, a fair woman. Oh, yeah, there's fair women in this world, but they're not very fair when it comes to the way they act. Hey, all you single guys in church, where's Rob? Uh, the Bible says, a jewel in the snout of a pig. So is a fair woman without discretion. A jewel in the, in the snout. Have you ever seen a, a pig? I'm telling you, they're the ugliest things you ever saw in your life. They, they act ugly. They're selfish. They, they root one another out when you pour the slop in their, in their uh, trough, and they just eat as fast as they can because they want to, they they, they're selfish. And if you get out in the woods down in southeast Texas where I'm from and you see a wild hog, you better run because he's got a big old tusk that comes out of his mouth and he'll rip you to shreds with that tusk if you mess with him. That's the way some of these fair women are <laughs> without discretion. Hey, you need discretion. Discretion is the way you act. Discretion is really, really wonderful to have. And the only way you can get that is be a partaker of the divine nature. Get filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I'm supposed to be teaching and I was fixing to start off preaching. You need the baptism of the Spirit of the Lord in your life so you can be adopted. Paul said uh, that we cry, Abba, Father. God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. We got the Spirit of Jesus in us. And we got the Spirit of hell in us too. Anyway, Abraham had this amazingly wonderful nature about him that he could just take whatever was left. Then we find some more about Abraham, that he was patient with God. God said, you're going to have a son. Your children are going to be as numerous as the stars of the heavens. But he waited 25 years. How, how many of us could wait 25 years believing God for a promise to be fulfilled and we wait for God for 30 minutes and we're all mad and upset. And Where's God at? Why didn't God hurry? Well, hurry up, God! 25 years. And then when he did get that boy, <laughs> the Lord said, take him over there and put a knife in his heart and sacrifice him on Mount Moriah. What a spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, it must have been wonderful to just hang around Abraham. He loved God. He loved God. Don't ever think that Abraham and God said you know what I'm going to I'm going to take that lineage of Abraham and and I'm going to produce a a savior for the world I am going to take the good naturedness that he's going to pass on to his children you know we do pass a lot of good thing or bad things on to our kids it's in our nature or it's not in our but I don't care what nature you got this morning. You can lose your, your, your family nature and you can get the nature that God wants you to have. Now are we the sons of God. Think about that. We are right now, we are 
sons and daughters of God because we're praying every day. We're reading our Bible every day. We are, we are going to church as often as we can. We gather together in prayer and we just pray for that divine nature and asking God to help us. Does anybody here ask God to help you every day? I was here praying this morning in the church and I said, you know, God, I can't do this. I, I, I can't do it. I can't save anybody. I can't preach with the anointing of God. I, I, I can't be the pastor of this church. I can't be the bishop around here. I need some help. I'm, I'm lost. I can't draw people in here. Well, we can draw them if we make enough peanut brittle. Actually, I've thought about having a, a commercial stove put up around the front of this pulpit here and, and us start making peanut brittle like you can't believe because people have been stopping uh, wanting peanut brittle all week long. We've already had two show up this morning. Didn't even come to church, but they come wanting peanut brittle. They didn't come to get the divine nature something a whole lot better than peanut brittle. I can't preach, but you know, my wife can make peanut brittle. And you get down there when they're making peanut brittle and everybody's happy and joyful and laughing. And you ask them to come to prayer meeting, they come walking in with the basset hound look. <laughs> I better get off that. Not everybody does. We have some folks that love to come to prayer. I know some of you get all beat up and banged around, you know, whenever on Fridays and we try to have prayer on Friday night from 7 to 8 and we have a great time. We had a good crowd here praying, amen. But uh, it seems like we enjoy peanut brittle making more than we do prayer. I can't figure that out, but maybe, maybe some of us have not left the old nature completely. You know, the old Indian said there's two dogs on the inside of me. One's a bad dog and one's a good dog. Whichever dog I feed is the one that wins the fight. Whichever one I starve is the one that loses. If you'll fast and pray, you're killing that old flesh, you know. But if you indulge yourself in sinful things, you're feeding the flesh and your spirit's going to be defeated. You want to live for God? Hang around the right kind of people. You want to live for God? You ain't going to never make it until you learn. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but the companion of fools shall be destroyed. You think you're strong enough to go to the bar and drink Dr. Pepper? You think you're strong enough to go to the crack house, amen, and just uh, witness to people? You better hang around the right kind of people. Because like the song said, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. Amen. Oh, praise God. And then Abraham had an ancestor, a, a, a descendant by the name of Judah. Anybody ever heard of Judah? Amen. It's where we get the word Jew. Judah. Oh, yes, Judah had some flaws in his life, but he really was a descendant of Abraham. He had the blessing of Abraham upon him. We don't see that blessing too much because Judah was the one that come up with the idea of selling Joseph into the land of Egypt, and perhaps that might have been uh, uh, the hand of God that spoke through Judah on that memorable occasion when the other nine brothers wanted to throw him in the pit and let him starve to death. You know, Joseph was that favorite son. I don't have time to tell the whole story. But it was Judah that looked up and he saw a caravan of Midianites and he said, we could sell our brother as a slave and we could benefit from it. And that's what they did. But after about 20 years, Judah had experienced a little bit of life. He'd experienced a little bit of, he, he kind of grew up a little. 
Aren't you glad we do kind of grow up after a while? And his dad did not want Benjamin to go to Egypt. And he said, no, no, I can't let Benjamin go. And Judah come along and said, well, Dad, I'll, I'll be personally responsible. We can't go and we can't come back unless we take Benjamin with us because that guy down there gave us a hard time and said, we've got to take our little brother if we ever come back. And so well, we want to take Benjamin. And, and Jacob said, okay, but you're responsible, son. And when Joseph incognito we got to messing with all of them and you know he had Benjamin framed looked like Benjamin stole the cup and uh, and they were going to put Benjamin in prison and really J Joseph just wanted to be with his little brother and reveal himself to his little brother incognito and he didn't want them other guys that hurt him to to know what was going on and I don't know what was in Joseph's mind but it kind of got messed up when Judah stepped up and said let me be put in prison for my brother Whoa. Uh, say that again, Judah? Yeah. He said, you know, I've got a dad that would probably die if we didn't bring Benjamin back, and I'm sorry that dad evidently loves Benjamin more than he loves the rest of us, but that's dad, and I can't stop dad from being that way. And I, but I still love dad, even though he may have a few flaws. Huh? J Joseph must have thought, what? What am I hearing here? That don't sound like the Judah I used to know. Judah? Have you changed? Yes. Oh, I thank God that life has an amazing way of changing us. It can change you for the bad, but it can also change you for the good. There's a few bumps in the road and you have a few disappointments and you have to go one way or the other. You have to get closer to God or get further away from God. And if you've got the baptism of the Holy Ghost and you love God, you're gonna find out that all things work together for the good to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. And if you'll pray over the bad things that happen in your life, you'll wind up being more like Jesus. Anyway, well, Joseph's plan fell apart at that point. <laughs> when he saw that Judah was willing to take his little brother's place and take the guilt, that was a prefiguration of Jesus, isn't it? That was the divine nature that God liked, and he thought, hey, I can use that. Oh, yeah, study the genealogy of Jesus, and you'll find a lot of wonderful people in his family tree. I like that story of Ruth. Now, boy, this is really amazing that God would see a little girl over there in Moab, a heathen country. And he would say, I would like to have a little some of that in the man that I'm going to produce. The man that's going to be the, his mother is going to be related to her. Oh, that Ruth, wasn't she a precious girl? Yeah, she married Elimelech's son and Naomi's son. And, and uh, it was just kind of amazing that God really probably didn't want Elimelech and Naomi to go to Moab just because there's a famine in Bethlehem doesn't mean you gotta run off. But they did. And the two boys married two girls in Moab. And one of them, well, they both died. The husband died, the Limelech died, the two boys died, and all Naomi had was two ex-daughter-in-laws. She said, I'm going back home. Ruth said, I want to go with you. No, 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 no. You're going back to your gods. You're going back to Moloch. You're going back to your people. And there was something in Ruth that said, I don't want to go back to my people. Something wrong with my family. Something wrong with the people that I grew up around. I, I feel something pulling on me. I want to know more about this God that you serve. I want to know more about your people, your family. 
Woo! She said, no, go on back home, Ruth. Just be like your, 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 your sister, Orpha. She just gave me a little peck on the cheek, you know. She just gave me a little kiss, and she went back to her people. But evidently there was a little something got a hold of Ruth and I don't know, maybe it was God, I don't know. But her words are recorded in the word of God. Ruth said, entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people and thy God, my God. Where thou diest, I will die. And there will I be buried. The Lord, now this is all capitals here. The Lord, that means she knew something about the Lord. She had the latest revelation of who God really was. She didn't say Elohim. She didn't say Adonai. She said Yahweh. That you know, that's kind of like saying Jesus, hallelujah. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. Amen. And when Naomi saw, she was steadfast. You know, some folks are not steadfast, some folks make promises one day and they forget about it the next. Some folks, oh, I've had people look at me and say, Brother Khan, if you ever see me going the wrong way, you be sure and come and tell me because I don't want to go the wrong way and they're not even here today for me to tell them that. And that's okay, I understand. We're like, you know, shipped in sand. We're, we're kind of like Jesus said, Peter, I want to make you a rock instead of just being shipped in sand. Simon is just a word that's pretty common and it really isn't very important, but I want to name you Cephas. God wants to change everybody's name in this church this morning. God wants to give you a name that you can be loyal, that you can be strong, that you can say, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to hang on to God. When things go bad, I'm still going to be hanging on to Jesus because I got the divine nature in me and it is steadfast, it's strong, and it can endure a little bit of confusion every once in a while. It can endure a little bit of, of guff every once in a while. I can get done wrong and still still love God. That was a question that Paul asked the Corinthians that wanted to take their brother to law, wanted to sue their brother in court. And Paul said, why don't you just, why don't you just let yourself be done wrong? Can you not be done wrong? You know, there's some folks in the kingdom of God can't be done wrong. If you do them wrong, if somebody, if, if they think somebody did them wrong, yeah. it's bad. Yeah. They ain't going to get over it. If you offend them, they ain't going to get over it. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, there must be heresies among us that they which are approved may be manifest. Now, that is scary, let me tell you. Oh, that is so scary. You know what? <laughs> God's not going to let hypocrites stay in his church. Did you know that? God's not going to let them which are not approved. You know who's not approved? Those that are walking in the flesh. Those that are not feeding the, the good dog. Those that are feeding the bad. Oh, yeah, you look really good out there with your halo shining. And I better get off of that. You done heard that sermon once, haven't you? Oh, that little bit of ingredient. Did you know Ruth became David's grandmother because she followed Naomi to Israel and her redeemer, her kinsman redeemer said, you know what? I think I need to raise up a son to carry on the name of Elimelech. And that son's name was uh, Oded. Boaz 
had Oded through Ruth. Oded had a son by the name of Jesse. Has anybody ever heard of the son of Jesse? Is it a coincidence that this is in the word of God? Or is it God saying, I'm going to have a, I'm going to produce a biological human being someday. That biological human being is going to be my son. And I want his mother to have as good a nature as she possibly can have. I don't want to live in some Well, I don't know how to finish that sentence. Sometimes it's best for you to just stop in mid-sentence and not finish it. But you know, when God got ready to use someone, he didn't find a prostitute down there somewhere to reproduce his son, did he? He found a virgin, a girl that was pure. A girl that had an ancestry. And I'm going to tell you something. You may not know it, but there's a big difference between a virgin and a non-virgin. A virgin is a girl that just has a pure mind. She's not messed up. I'm not saying that... Well, I think you understand what I'm saying. I'm getting in trouble. God wanted a pure vessel to use to reproduce himself. Amen. And of course, look at David. Look at that ancestor of Jesus. One of the most fabulous ancestors that anybody could ever have. Wouldn't it be neat if we all could say, one of my ancestors was King David, you know, that guy that killed the giant. He had the faith. He had the faith to step out in the valley of Elah with five stones and a sling and say, I come to you in the name of the Lord. And he smote the giant in the forehead and severed his head with his own sword. But that wasn't near as great a battle as when the Bible says David behaved himself wisely. That's what's phenomenal. It's not so much a phenomenon that a rock hit a giant in the forehead and the head was cut off. But when someone has a measure of success, you know, success is dangerous. Did you know that? If it wasn't so dangerous, we'd all be millionaires, wouldn't we? Well, maybe you are millionaires. But there's three places in the 18th chapter of the book of uh, 1 Samuel, right after David killed the giant, the scripture says that David behaved himself wisely. You know what that means? <laughs> that means he kept his humility. He didn't get lifted up over him being the first giant killer in the land of Israel. He didn't say, you know what? I've done something in this country that nobody else has ever done. Nobody has ever killed a giant, but I did. You better look up to me. I need to be uh, an important person. No, sir. David behaved himself wisely. And when Saul said, whose son is this anyway? And David said, I'm the son of Jesse. He didn't even call his name. He said, Jesse is my dad. What a spirit. And he went out before Israel and he slew the Philistines and they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands and yet David never did get to the place that he thought he was greater than his king. When his king turned against him and Saul thought that he wanted to get his position and David had him in a cave and he could have slit his throat and done away with his enemy, he just cut off part of his skirt of his robe and he went following out the cave and said, I'm sorry, Saul, you're trying to kill me but I felt bad for disrespecting you. 
by cutting off part of your robe. God said, that's what I want in the genealogy that I'm going to be a part of. What a spirit. And when David did make his mistakes, and we kind of we kind of understand that, I guess, in some ways, don't we? When David got carnal, he did some bad stuff, but he got prayed back through. Anybody ever had that problem? Anybody ever done something stupid and you got prayed back through? Well, let David be human, okay? He messed up, but he got prayed back through. Hallelujah. Well, the prophet come along and said, thou art the man. And he could have said, well, take this guy out and sever his head. He's falsely accusing me. He didn't do that. He repented. But one of David's most fabulous moments, I suppose, was when he was fleeing from Absalom, his own son that was going to try to kill him. And there was a descendant of King Saul that stepped out. His name was Shimei. Shimei said, go on up, you bloody man. And when you say bloody man in Old English, that was really very, very bad. And that's the way it's translated in the Old English. Go on up, you bloody man. And he began to throw rocks at David. Began to throw things at him. He was up high on a ridge, and he was looking down on David. And David in his time of mourning, in his time of despair, you know, you're going to have people that are going to be that way. Amen. They're going to kick you when you're down. Yeah. You're really not going to find out who your real enemies are until you're down. Yes. You don't know who your friends are when you're up because everybody wants to be your friend when you're king. But when you're on the run, that's when you find who your real Amen. friends are. And one of David's nephews by the name of Abishai said, well, king, he's cursing you, saying bad things. Uh, if you'll just give me the nod, I'll go shut his mouth forever. <coughs> Abishai had killed 300 men at one time. And if you can kill 300 men at one time, surely you can take care of one big fat mouth that needs to be shut up. I mean, Shimei wasn't very smart. You know that. But David said, this is what he said. I wish I could be this way. I can by the help and grace of God. He said, what have I to do with you, you son of Ab... Uh, well, whatever his mother's name was, I can't even remember it right now. Zariah. Yeah. That was David's sister, it's believed. You sons of Zariah. You know, that was Joab and Abishai. What have I to do with thee? My own son is trying to kill me. How much more will this man say these ugly things? It might be that the Lord would reward me good for allowing this man to curse me today. Which means if we take things patiently, if we let people gossip about us and not call them on the phone to try to straighten them out. Amen. Oh, I just preached to somebody just now. Hallelujah. I felt a flinch out there. Oh, hallelujah. If we just let those ugly words on Facebook just roll off of us like water off of a duck's back, if we can just keep our emotion under control and not retaliate, it might be that the Lord would send us a special blessing on down the road somewhere. And wouldn't you know <laughs> that it happened in David's life? David's son did not kill him. David came back and became the king. And Shimei was one of the first ones to meet him at the Jordan. Oh, yes, Shimei, that guy that cursed David, that guy that said all that bad stuff about David, said, oh, king, I wanted to be the first to come and welcome you back home. Yeah, you hypocrite, you devil. 
We know who you really was a few weeks ago when you said all that bad stuff. But David was gracious. David was merciful. David was gentle and kind. And Abishai steps up and said, shouldn't the man that cursed the Lord's anointed be dealt with? And David said, no, we're not going to. We're not, nobody's going to die today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just pardon this man. Hey, just let go of all the bitterness and the ought and the hate and the bad feeling. Put it in God's hands and let God deal with your enemy. That's, and so, ladies and gentlemen, we come to that moment when that baby was born in 4 B.C. by the name of Jesus and it all comes to a climax. The entire Bible comes to a climax in the 22nd chapter of the book of Luke where Jesus was praying in the garden and he said, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Folks, our salvation depended upon Jesus getting to the point where he could say, nevertheless, if I can't persuade God to let me die in a, in a normal way, I've got to die the, the death of being crucified. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Folks, that's the spirit that we've got. Now, you may not be letting that spirit really grow in your heart and mind and life. It's up to you. But that's the kind of spirit and attitude that will make you happier than any other way in life. You think that you can make yourself happy and give yourself joy by taking up for yourself and being like your mother was or your dad was or your grandpa was or whoever in your family that you grew up thinking was cool. But it's time for you to lose sight of your family tree and understand that your real family is the family of God. Amen. And that family is good and holy and right. And we have the fruit of love and joy and peace and long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. But your family tree is going to produce adultery, fornication, emulation, wrath, sedition, drunkenness, strife, and such like. Read about it in the fifth chapter of the book of Galatians. Hello. I don't have the power to make you do the right thing. And I don't guess God's really going to cancel your will. You've got to yield your will to the spirit of Jesus. I'm so glad that one day I repented of my sins. I died. I died to what I want to do. I died to my family tree. And they took me and they put me in a baptismal tank. And they buried the old man. And I rose to walk in newness of life. And I got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. God took this old tongue of mine and I spoke in a language I didn't know much about. And I started walking a different road. I got off the broad path and started walking the narrow path. And folks, my life has been so much better than it would have been if I hadn't started walking with Jesus. How about you this morning? Jesus said, except you're born of water and spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Let's stand to our feet, everybody. Oh, glory, glory, glory. Let's thank the Lord for this.